Africa is known as the mother of humanity and India is known as the cradle of civilization. It's very interesting because the mother gives birth to the child and the child is in the cradle. So my own understanding is that yes, the first humanity springing out of apes probably was born or emerged out of the ape in South Africa. And then it traveled far and wide. It would dwell in the caves, the caveman. And then when it came to India, it found a new cave dwelling because it seems as it entered India, it chosen country for various purposes. So certain beings, the mother uses the word, they were involutionary beings, the rishis. They came from the higher world because the time had come, humanity had travelled so much to show them the way to eternal rest and peace. Shantim Saswati Netaresham. So they entered another cave and the cave was the heart cave. So to discover another world. So this this like they were newborn and the newborn is in a cradle. So that's how civilization began to develop because they made some fascinating discovery. These primitive people discovered the one indivisible existence. So it's very fascinating the discovery of the rishis, the Vedantic seers and we just read last time how they discovered. It's very interesting. And then by the help of reason, pure reason, by the help of intuition, with the help of subliminal self, enlarging their, through psychological states, enlarging some inner mind as well as the inner senses. And then finally through a direct identity, experience and identity, they discovered some profound truth. What they were searching? They were searching for the ultimate mysteries of existence. Why were they searching? Very logical because Unless we know that stable basis from which everything has emerged, all our knowings will always be incomplete. This is the basic uh, common sense. So uh, while the world was engaged with forms and what is behind the form, the energy, they took a deep dive and they went behind and beyond the form to look for that stable, last stable basis, thanu, that on which everything rests. Why they believed that there should be a stable basis? Well, uh, any uh, human intuition and common sense would make us feel like that. It's uh, very simple. It's, there is a little aphorism of Shurabindo to that regard that someone came to an engineer's house uh, and this man didn't believe in a creator and there was a model of uh, a nice uh, ship or something which was there on his table. And this man saw it and was very fascinated. He said, ah, so lovely. Who made it? He said, nobody. <laughs> he said, don't be joking. Yeah, yeah nobody. Are you, please tell me who made it? Where did you get it from? He said, no, no, randomly some people were throwing some sticks and needles and this has come up. So this was to convey that when we look at this world, this fascinating world, an innate intuition, common sense, deeper reason, whatever we may say, there is something or someone out there whom we do not know. It's an intuitive sense which comes within us. Only thing is we don't search, we live in belief and non-belief. But they were seekers, they were involutionary beings, they had come to show the path, the way. And again, it's very logical that if we go behind each finite, how did this finite come into existence? You'll have another finite. Maybe larger unit, you go behind it, still larger unit. Keep on going. What will be that last point? It has to be infinite, there is no other way. <laughs> because. You go to the last limit of finite, whether one expands or one goes deeper, infinity can be understood in different ways. Understood, I mean, it's an experience one can have, but let's say to a mental understanding, you take a paper and um, cut it into as many pieces till the last atom, till the last uh, atom school. Uh, it's, a, it's a word 
<laughs> not found in dictionary till the last particle you still can divide it technically you can do it technically because the moment you say it's a particle it can be divided so what is the limit of that division no limit literally so where is all this happening so when they looked at this boundless energy whirling in space dancing and at the same time in such a way that it defies all uh, uh, human thought it baffles human thought <coughs> they inevitably had this sense of an infinite something or someone behind this movement and a simple way to experience it in fact it's a very good remedy for all problems uh, whenever i mean temporary remedy it can be a permanent remedy also when one is distressed because of events and circumstances in life the mother gives us a very beautiful meditation she says just for a moment contemplate the boundlessness of space where is, we know that space is i mean the stars are moving that first breathe out of the universe or breathe in of the universe is still continuing to expand so the question is what is it expanding in so we are told space but space by its nature you measure the stars and you say this is space so is this extension causing space or is there a pre existent space in which it is going in which case where is that end point is there an end point or not so when we just contemplate the boundlessness of space and then we get back so we are for a moment uh, disoriented this whole life appears like a not even fraction of a moment equally another simultaneous meditation that she gives is contemplate the endlessness of time so when did time begin what is the beginning of time now we use the word past present future but if we step back it's a way of saying nothing else it's a question of how my consciousness fixes itself if i stand and watch the sea unfolding itself on the shore there is a wave that is coming from there coming touching this and going back and then new waves are coming you see amazing meditation on this sea this sea is uh, a great gift so when we just observe these waves we we just can conceptualize time how it's a one single stream but we don't know so we have this idea that there is a beginning and we have this idea it is going to end but there is no ultimate end it's always a new beginning the waves crash against the shore they don't end they start a new cycle why because there is a infinite energy which is constantly throwing itself in numerous forms waves this that hundred things so when we look at this there were two approaches which people took one was they looked at form each form is a it's manifesting in boundless space and time it's the creation of an infinite energy and people started digging the form the other was they went deep inside and discovered this infinite energy this stream of time and space expanding and then they said this is of no importance that is the ultimate reality so this became as if unimportant one line of later vedantic thought we read last time later vedantic thought essence is important this is not important and there is another line of thought the materialist says what will i do with all this boundless uh, timeless and beyond existence let me handle the thing which i have at hand but both are needed for a complete understanding this is what shubhendu speaks of is integral view of things this is needed that is also needed both are needed then we have the complete understanding as shubhendu says you cannot understand water unless you know brahman unless you know god he uses the word god very beautifully so why because that is the origin to understand it is representing something and see how shubhendu in alipur jail has this uh, vision of brahman how he describes 
People say Shrivind is difficult. See, he is several places he uses such analogy. Baat baat me, just casually, he is writing tales of prison life, and he describes three types of Brahman. How he doesn't say, okay, I am going to tell you about Brahman. He says, you know, every day we were given lufsi in in the same bowl, which served like the omnipotent Brahman to start with, because it was multi-purpose. Just like Brahman can become many forms. So this bowl was used for drinking water, for ablutions, for food, everything. But then he doesn't stop there, and he said, when the lufsi kichudi, I think, uh, is was provided. One day it was all white, no pulse, nothing in it. It is more or less like boiled rice of what quality, some water in it. He said this was like pure sad Brahman. <laughs> and some days it was yellow because some dal is in it, and it was like hiranyagarbha, the golden <laughs> womb of all things. See, this is Shurvindo, and then. He says, some days we could see some uh, odd sprout or some green out there. Now uh, he says, this is Brahman in manifesting in many different forms and names. Now this is how Shurbindo could transmute that experience of the jail into something just amazing. And really, often when I drink water, I feel it is really Brahman in many ways. Whatever sweet you may have tasted, I am sure it's about food also. So I don't know whether I should drink water immediately or I should drink it little later. If I drink immediately, it reminds me, see, everything is transient. The next moment, taste is gone. Don't know, it does something, <laughs> it's really <laughs> a Brahman which has taken this form of washing away everything. So in every element of creation, every particle, there is the presence of this great reality which they were searching. Primitive people, okay, quote, unquote, brackets. <laughs> they were searching for the ultimate realities and they found and they spoke about it. So one of their discoveries was, and with which we are going to start today, there is a chapter called Pure Existent. So what is existent? So we know about existence. They found Satchidanand. Existence, consciousness, bliss. That sounds very impersonal, existence. But existent... Who is existing is personal, existent, conscious, the conscious in all that is unconscious, apparently unconscious. The one who is full of delight, anandamaya, in all that is, uh, throws these strands or vibrations of pain, pleasure and indifference. The one anandamaya. So, existent is pure existent. So, it touches upon these two ways of looking at that ultimate stable basis on which the whole dance is taken, taking place. And in a way, this phrase, pure existent, is straight, one could say, defining the Isha Upanishad way of describing that reality. It describes in two terms. I may not remember the full thing, but it describes it that pure, bodiless, without sinews and without uh, muscles or something. And on the other hand, it equally describes it in terms that are just like there is a being, the unfaultless, such is the being, the all-compassionate, different ways of describing. So pure refers to that state of existence where it is unsullied. What does it mean? We all are some kind of existence. We all exist. But here existence has got mixed in so many, it has got diminished, it has got, you know, uh, limited, at least the sense that we have of the, our own existence, a very limited existence, surface existence. But the pure existence is infinite. But it is not just existence, it is existent. So now comes the personal aspect. And it is a big difference, because if it is only existence, it is something impersonal. That's how the many Jnana Yogis approach the Self. And scientists like it. Existence. So you climb to the existence. It's an impersonal state. But the moment we say existent, then we can relate. 
we can say please help me see i am trying to climb and what is that existent it is infinite so this is the pure existent which they discovered it is personal it is impersonal but even that does not exhaust it they were masters of seeking they said okay from one side we can approach as what we call as god though this term mother and shubindu are very careful in using because the term has been not only diluted distorted and that we will see how it has been distorted and on the other side it expresses manifest itself as comes to us as something which is impersonal endless infinite so there must be something still not anterior because time has not begun but something where these two are and which is still beyond and they use the word absolute so you have impersonal personal and the absolute now this is so beautifully conjured in this term this all the way i have understood om tat sat we all indians are conversant with it sat existent sat purush he is existent he is that personal aspect tat that so when you don't want to give it a name form and i mean it's beyond name and form but when you don't want to call it personal so you use the word that and when you want to call it personal you say he that purusha there and this he am i so either ways and then something which transcends and yet is contained in both of these contain that is om so this is there such wonderful discoveries and what is that discovery in one line from chandogya upanishad shobindu writes one indivisible one indivisible that is pure existence so here he is using the, the it existence but the chapter is existent because either way we can look at it so chandogya upanishad and then he gives us a it's it's meditation people often say what meditation has shobindu given i mean many of these passages are meditation in the sense when we read them and we try to enter into that state that shurubindu is uh, describing for us or leading us to it is imagine you know someone taking us by the hand and taking us to let's say the cave of amarnath now after you reach amarnath what do you say i want to learn a technique of meditation when swami vekananda stood before that uh, snow shivling he was in rapture that yes i have seen the lord because you let there through any physical thing can become a symbol yesterday we had read it can become an occasion for the discovery of the divine why because infinite hides behind everything see how how catholic sanatan dharma can be that anything can we can pick up a flower and go into trance we should be careful not to go on the road of course many people do this mobile trance they are walking <laughs> are flipping through the mobile and they go into trance unfortunately the drivers don't realize it so we <laughs> that trance, not that trance. but literally see chaitanya mahaprabhu he looked at the sea what did he see in the sea he saw the color of the sky reflected he said my krishna my krishna my neela and as the story goes it plunged into it anything can become a cause for entry into discovery of the divine who is the soul existent indivisible existence behind all things this is the great truth formula which comes from this reality so one of the great saints have said that he took a different turn na mandir mein na masjid mein na kaaba ke alash mein but what did indian thought kankad mein bhi patthar mein bhi vrikshon mein bhi mandir mein bhi <laughs> kaaba ke alash mein bhi everywhere there is one reality now that of course is being discovered everywhere he was hidden inside but <laughs> that's a different story <laughs> so <laughs> there is one reality which is it is how beautiful it is you can take a human being that also shubindu says if you take a human being as your guru 
he may have defects, but it doesn't matter if you really regard him like that. Because that's how it operates. You can pick up anything and meditate upon it. But for that, what is required, and that's what we read on page 78, when we withdraw our gaze from its egoistic preoccupation with limited and fleeting interests, and look upon the world with dispassionate and curious eyes that search only for the truth. This is meditation. Do we need to learn a technique after this? It's not looking at WhatsApp. Not we look behind appearances. What should be our state? There is a line in Savitri. We must search with spiritual fire, with curious and dispassionate search for truth. There is a truth in everything. We don't understand that humility. That's why the Ishopanishad reminds. And many of these mystics say, the other day I was listening to one of the songs where he says, uh, you know, there is a, it's about a Sufi saint. So he, <laughs> it's, a, it's a funny story, but very interesting story. So the Sufi saint says, Anal Haq, you must have heard about, you know. It basically means I am that. In certain sense, it's a very mystic, profound mystic experience, like Swamasmi. So he was executed. So he tells the fellow saint, Why am I being executed? Did I say anything wrong? He said, No, you didn't say anything wrong. You said that was the mistake because there are things so secret and secret that they are not to be told. He says, Ki, I too know this truth. But why I am saved is because I never mentioned this. <laughs> Just look at it. The story works at different levels. But there is a profound mystery. We search for truth. We don't start labeling it. We don't start with a, oh, truth is this, truth is that. With curious eyes, what is truth? And when we do that, what do we find? Our first result is the perception of a boundless energy of infinite existence infinite movement, infinite activity pouring itself out in limitless space in eternal time. So this was, see nowadays why there is so much insomnia. I have my own reason for it. Earlier, we used to sleep outside. So what did we see? We saw the stars. <laughs> we didn't count the stars but it gives natural sleep. You sleep, you see the stars, boundlessness, it immediately, you know. We used to sometimes also say, oh, this is that star. It puts you to sleep, you enter into a state of vastness. Now, even if you sleep outside, there are no stars, especially in Delhi and some places. So, what do you do? So, you take sleeping pills to enter into that state. I mean, you don't need to take sleeping pills. But this, he's saying, what do you find? You find boundless energy playing in space. Whirling and look at how Shivinda puts it. The hand that sent Jupiter spinning through heaven spends all its cunning to fashion a curl. And he comes to it subsequently. In eternal time, an existence that surpasses infinitely our ego or any ego or any collectivity of egos in whose balance the grandiose products of aeons are but the dust of a moment and in whose incalculable sum, numberless, myriads count only as a petty swarm. Just to read this line and contemplate the stars who have been witness to pralayas. Many of these stars, they are witness to the pralayas. But they have lived for so long. Some of them which we see today are no more in existence. Some that has come into existence are no more there. That's why one of the simple methods to relax is to watch space, drift of galaxies with beautiful music. It's something, it takes us into that state. Only thing is, somebody in America may patent it, I don't know. Space meditation, give it a little technical name. Hundred dollars and then there will be variations. No, this is that space meditation, this space meditation. But it is freely available. God has given us this original temple. And then he says, we instinctively act and feel and weave our life thoughts as if this stupendous world movement were at work around us as center and for our benefit, for our help or harm, 
or as if the justification of our egoistic cravings emotions ideas standards were its proper business even as they are our own chief concern why didn't god do this for me why did he not do this why did he do this to me are you give him rest <laughs> so I mean, his concern should be only to satisfy my ego and if it doesn't then he is a bad guy out there this is the way we are preoccupied then no yoga can even begin with this idea we have to start with this that i don't know the ways of god these are his ways and his ways in his works and his cunning but who is he by what name he is he known this should be the state no preconceived notions so this is how they searched when we begin to see we perceive that it exists for itself ask the universe sir do you remember me <laughs> even as human beings is so difficult and worst is when people call on phone sir <laughs> do you remember me <laughs> now you know sometimes even you noted the number and you don't can't recollect now you are caught either ways you are not supposed to tell a lie <laughs> and if you say <laughs> yes then people know that after so much hesitation so they are okay tell me my name <laughs> so the standard way is i remember you but i have forgotten the name <laughs> so <laughs> this is so when we look at it it exists for itself so this is the way it is to start with we, we should not be disappointed because what comes next will follow it lives for its own gigantic aims its own complex and boundless idea its own vast desire or delight that it seeks to fulfill its own immense and formidable standards asteroids whirling in space new stars coming into existence dropping down which look down as if with an indulgent and ironic smile at the pettiness of ours so we had this story about medanand ji used to go out of the body and he describes in one of his uh, um, short little things he went out and he got lost where in space he doesn't know how to come back so he asks here there nobody can tell he not even orient earth earth now you say which earth because there are so many earths there are so many worlds so he is lost absolutely and then he meets two beings very tall being and he is trying to describe it suddenly one of them understands and he asks sure been those earth he says yes and he is thrown back into the body and he discovers ah i am back into the body well in those worlds it is known as sure been those earth <laughs> here we know it in 100 names and yet let us not swing over to the other extreme and form too positive an idea of our own insignificance only shubindu can write like this look at the beauty of this sentence marvel he is not writing that if we swing to the oh it is existing for its own gigantic games within itself who are we sir you are an insignificant little dust he is not using the word negative an idea he is saying let us not form too positive an idea of our insignificance some people take a great pride who are we that's how you know shri ramakrishna when uh, swami vivekananda no before that he asked nagmahashay uh, tell me somebody asked who am i like that he said ask nag nag is a bhakta so he said who who are you nag he is i am just the dust of your feet he smiled he says wait 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 narendra is coming So we can understand it. He says, "Who are you?" Narin. They are asking. He says, "I am the eternal infinite." So he says, <laughs> "That's a Gyan Yogi speaking." Both are true. It's not this or that. So here comes this punch line. That too would be an act of ignorance and the shutting of our eyes to the great facts of the universe. So what is this fact? now he reveals some facts of a different kind for the boundless movement does not regard us as unimportant to it science reveals to us how minute is the care 
how cunning the device how intense the absorption it bestows upon the smallest of its work works even as on the largest that's what we said that how the galaxies and stars are spinning space look at the shell the way it is formed even the atom how it beautifully it is if somebody could amplify molecules inside the water crystals how they form everything is amazing so it looks like he has invested as much energy the hand that spent jupiter spinning through heaven spends all its cunning to fashion a curl as much in the blooming of a rose as in the outburst of stars so let us remember to that there is nothing insignificant that's why shubhendu says to us to nothing should be insignificant insignificant it's not like this is big work this is uh, small work to god size neither of them and he says something very beautiful this mighty energy is an equal and impartial mother samam brahma in the great term of the gita and its intensity and force of movement is the same in the for formation and upholding of a system of suns and the organization of the life of an ant hill see how simple beautiful look at an ant hill and look at the skyscrapers in new york city and you just wonder look at the way the birds weave in as that's why when we look at nature there is a way to look at nature it can take us closer to god everything that's how it is described it's the divine in the various mutable becomings there also one can feel that flow so when we look at it how they know how they navigate they were saying how they build a nest how they know exactly how precisely to pick up things and utilize it the crow who literally you know how this intelligence works in them <clears throat> if we it is the illusion of size of quantity that induces us to look on the one as great the other as petty this must for to sober our ego big man great man <laughs> there is only one greatness there is a very beautiful writing of shurbindo the greatness of the great the greatness of the great is the divine energy working in them and the day the divine energy withdraws for whatever reason that the story in mahabharat arjun the great warrior and shri krishna is leaving he entrust all the ranis to arjun's care and there comes a time when these ordinary robbers and bandits take away and arjun is unable to do anything he tries to put that dori on the pratyancha on the gandi string he is unable to do it so he takes the bow and runs after them that is the state in which you see so we think great and small but in everything there is the same divine investing the same amount of energy and power so this is one illusion we have to get rid of but this again is the illusion of quality when we go behind and examine only the intensity of the movement of which quality and quantity are aspects we realize that this brahman dwells equally in all existences that's what is meant by the gita sama lost kanchana it does it, gita is not telling us that go to the um, jeweler and tell him you know i have read the gita your gold should be given at the same price as mud well mud has its own potential out of mud we can build many things even a murti is some idol something very beautiful we can build out of mud and gold has its own potential and there is the divine who is equally in in all of them filling them with potentialities which we don't know so the one is the illusion of quantity solar system and water and illusion of quality an ant hill or an ant looks like greater than a mountain why because the ant is living there is something extra both these illusions we must get rid of brahman dwells equally in all existence existences equally partaken of by all in its being we are tempted to say equally distributed to all in its energy but this too is an illusion of quantity brahman dwells in all indivisible yet as if divided and distributed looks like that and this is important for our own 
purposes because he wants to manifest his infinity through finite forms and names. If we look again with an observing perception not dominated by intellectual concepts but informed by intuition and culminating in knowledge by identity, we shall see that the consciousness of this infinite energy is other than our mental consciousness, that it is indivisible and gives not an equal part of itself but its whole self at one and the same time to the solar system and to the ant hill. How does it do it? That is something very interesting. At one place Sri says the energy that goes into expression is the same energy which goes into depression. You have never thought like that. How does it do it? It gives itself fully to make an ant hill. Holds back what it needs to hold back and express whole of itself but in an ant hill. And the same it gives itself, expands itself in the solar system. Holds back what needs to be held back. So always behind every finite there is the infinite. This is what he is wanting us to know and remember. Quality to Brahman there are no whole and parts. But each thing is all itself and benefits by the whole of Brahman. And that's where we have the analogy of the ocean and the waves. The wave may say, see I am so small. Tuchy prani. Or the bigger wave may say, see you are so small. As the ocean. I am equally in all. With all my being I have entered. In some I have created intensity, in some other I have held back the intensity. But all of me is in each and every uh, particle of dust. And that opens doors to a new science altogether. We can connect with anything and everything. Make it an occasion not only of worship but contact with the infinite who is within and behind. Quality and quantity differ. The self is equal. The form and manner and result of the force of action vary infinitely but the eternal primal infinite energy is the same in all so we may ask that sir that is okay but Arjun is Arjun isn't it opposite side there is somebody ordinary warrior he say I am equally in all so in Arjun I am expressing in terms of a certain quality and quantity in the weak person I am holding back <laughs> this is how he operates so that's what we see below the force of strength that goes to make the strong man is no whit greater than the force of weakness that goes to make the weak. The energy spent is as great in repression as in expression, in negation as in affirmation, in silence as in sound. So many doors it opens. Every weakness has a possibility of innately of strength. And this happens when there is a great crisis. You see sudden we, people whom one considered is no good, can suddenly come up and fate take the challenge of life. It's so strange. Equally, that when we repress something, it's not that, you know, you are holding back an energy. So what is the way? If not expression and repression, sublimation, transmutation, offering, rejection, this is what Sri the says. But when you just hold it back, it's the same energy. So that's how the mother puts it, that people who are all the time indulging in food like a glutton and the person who is devising ways and means of not eating, fasting, it is the same tendency taking two forms. So that's why she gave this formula. Eat as much as you can digest, take as much as you can eat. So basic idea is that either ways, if you use energy forcibly to suppress something, it is the same. Therefore, the first reckoning we have to mend is that between this infinite movement, this energy of existence, which is the world and ourselves, at present we keep a false account. So what is our account? We are infinitely important to the all. But to us, the all is negligible. We alone are important to ourselves. Why you didn't do this to me? Why you didn't give this to me? Are what have you given? All is not important to us. It's God's duty to do it. He better do it. So we keep a false account. So one way to look at it is apni dun mein, apni masti mein. He is not like fulfilling his own stupendous aims, gigantic aims. 
So this is one way to look at it. So right now this, this is the sign of the original ignorance which is the root of the ego that it can only think with itself as center as if it were the all. And of that which is not itself accepts only so much as it is mentally disposed to acknowledge. So you see this is where the problem comes, a few lines below. This mental self-sufficiency of man creates a system of false accountantship which prevents us from drawing the right and full value from life. So we have that story of Guru Nanak when he was caught by the Mughals and put in jail and along with this that Banda Bahadur and both are in jail and he asks the question, why you? I am just a toddler on the way. You are a realized person. I know it. Why you have to suffer like this? And then he says, I will tell you in the morning. <laughs> so when they wake up in the morning, he says, the whole night I couldn't sleep thinking of this question. He says, okay, I will tell you, but first tell me how many hands you have crushed below your, when you are sleeping. And he says, oh, many of them. He says, see, you are questioning God's wisdom. Do you know where we stand? Before is infinity. <laughs> Very sobering experience. That we think we are so important. For whatever reason. But to that, one way to look at it, it has its own ways. It has its own fulfillment. And this is the first lesson. Humility comes that way. Humility is never before others. Oh, I am nothing, nobody, you know, it's all. That's not humility. That is pretension. Because nowadays, being humble also is, adds to your biodata or psychodata. Oh, he is so humble. Touch him on the wrong note and see how humble humility crumbles. Humility is to be humble before the divine. That really before him we are nothing, we can do nothing. And this is an experience anybody can have. That truly without that we don't even exist. This plain common sense doesn't require even any deep meditation. And we'll stop with this sentence. There is a sense in which these pretensions of the human mind and ego repose on a truth. But this truth only emerges when the mind has learned its ignorance and the ego has submitted to the all and lost in it its separate self-assertion. So when we children, many bhajans, one of these bhajans was Suna hai ta, I'll tell in Hindi then. Suna hai tare hai tumne lakho, hame bhi taro to hum bhi jane. Basically it means that I believe you have liberated many. When you liberate me then I will know. Oh, this is stupid, you know. <laughs> God, miracle to order. It doesn't work like that. It does not deal with that kind of a business. Yes, what happened with Draupadi? It happened with Draupadi. You all Draupadi, self lost, trapped, absorbed. Ecstatically in Krishna, when she realizes that there is nobody and none, Krishna, Krishna, Krishna. If we can enter into that state, then this applies. So when we are, it is true at one level, but if we start misapplying it, do nothing, sit like a lazy bone and want to divine to do all for us, well, we are misusing a great truth uh, for our petty purposes. So. Uh, he says that both these extremes we have to avoid. So we will uh, stop here, come back after 10 minutes. I thought I'll, I'm, I'm going just enjoying the passages rather than rushing through. So today is the last day here. So I don't know, maybe I'll complete this, should complete this. We'll go a little uh, hurriedly. So we'll uh, complete this pure existence. And when we meet in February, we'll start with conscious force. Tomorrow is Savitri Bhavan, just to make the announcement. Um, that will be like, I don't know what it will be like. I've just given the title, introduction, uh, summary, like that's how it is of the Life Divine. Uh, 